Good morning and welcome to St John's Online um, gathering together and uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, I don't know about you but I've had a, a quite an interesting week. Um, I've been uh, tuning into uh, the New Wine Leadership uh, course conference which has been, um, yeah, it's been very good, quite intense because of course it's all online. And I don't know about you, just as you're watching me now, um, I've been kind of watching various people, um, you know, with, with, with breaks, but um, for about three days. And um, so my eyes are kind of like um, slightly, slightly boggled, I think. But, um, but anyway, it's been really good. And, we, and I've learnt a lot about coming out, as it were. Uh, some really good speakers talking about coming out of the storm, coming out of the storm. And, um, and I guess that's what we're doing, isn't it? There's a kind of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, uh, you know, we are definitely coming out of this COVID time together. So let's just keep pressing into God. And, and as God shows us what he wants us to do, um, today we're going to be looking at uh, Judas, uh, Judas Iscariot. And yeah, he started off, didn't he, as, uh, as one of uh, Jesus' main disciples. He was, a, he was a, um, definitely, you know, affiliated with those who were closest to Jesus. But things went wrong, didn't they? And I suppose today it's a challenge for all of us as we look um, at what a good disciple is. And perhaps, you know, for me, when I was watching the monologue, it, it showed me that, you know, I just, just needed to keep pressing into God. And I wanted to be, you know, a disciple who either for me or against me, Jesus says. So let's just pray. Father, we thank you for um, what you are doing through this uh, challenging time. And Lord, I just pray as we see the light at the end of the tunnel, as we come out of this uh, lockdown, I just pray, Lord, that you would just um, continue to speak into our lives. And uh, Lord, help us to stay close to you and to discover afresh uh, what it is to be your disciple um, in these times. We ask this in Jesus' name. Blessed be your name when the sun shines. 
It's a real privilege for me to uh, welcome Jack on the sofa today. Um, Jack and I have got to know each other over the last uh, few years now, Jack, I think, isn't it, really? Yeah. And um, I know kind of quite a lot's been kind of happening in all our lives through this um, tough old time, this lockdown time. Um, could you just, yeah, just tell us a bit about yourself, you know, what you're doing, um, you know, hopes, aspirations, dreams. Yeah, no, but. <laughs> so, uh, my name's Jack. 28 years old, soon to be 29 years old. Um, old What's that? I know, yeah, time's <laughs> going away. Um, yeah, I grew up in Chigwell, moved to Collier Road, moved to Harold Wood. I'm not currently living in Brentwood, in my own place. Um, uh, just done a, f a bit, spent most of my adult life working up the city, doing reinsurance, involved in that world, a lot of travel yeah. abroad and stuff like that. Um, but then, in, during lockdown last year, I found out that I was losing my job, so I'm currently looking for a new job. So that's a, it's an interesting time at the minute. It's, it's nice to be able to down tools and recharge, but at the same time, it's kind of trying to... Let me just break in. Um, uh, yeah, so, so by losing your job, did that make you, you know, did that make you reconsider what you're doing? And... Um, not at first, no. I thought initially I just thought I'd carry on, I'd find something the next day. I had a call from another company doing exactly what I did and they sounded positive and then that didn't turn out. So I was pretty disappointed when that didn't turn out. And then once I got that news, I started to think, oh, what else can I be doing? So I started exploring similar jobs, but just changing slightly, slight tweaks. I still do reinsurance, but just different aspects of it. Yeah. And then I looked at doing broking instead of underwriting, and that's where I am now. But in the last few weeks or so, I had a bit of a kind of a sort of entrepreneur moment where I was driving around <laughs> looking for a nice coffee and I couldn't find one. So I've kind of got it in my head now that I want to be a uh, world famous coffee shop owner. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, yeah, that's so, so coffee's a bit. You know, oh, I love, I love coffee, coffee. yeah. Right. I've always, I, I used to hate it growing up. It was one thing that I never drunk, so I'd always right. avoid it. And I got a job in the city and everyone went for a coffee. And I'd always order a tea and he'd say, when are you going to grow up and have a coffee? And I'd be oh, I, like, I don't like it, it's disgusting. But I always like the smell. So I sat there in work one day, I stayed late on my own and I had a coffee. <laughs> I hated it. And then I had another one, and then I just kept going like during work mm. until I started liking them. And then I just went to my boss and was like, do you want to go for a coffee? And he's like, and I was like, yeah, I drink coffee now. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, yeah this will bring you out. You've I finally grown up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's where I've got my love of coffee from. Now I'm a coffee snob. So I've gone from hating right. it to just being mm. a bit of a snob with my coffee now. So I think that's really my, um, my dream at the minute, really, is to... I've, I've enjoyed the city. It's been fantastic. Made a lot of friends and enjoyed that kind of lifestyle and stuff but but you only get one life so it's good to kind of do what you want to do and change it up a bit rather than just ploughing on and doing the same thing all the time so yeah so you think during this time uh this whole lockdown it's made you kind of just rethink yeah definitely not yeah not the whole lockdown just i'd say since yeah. this, this this year maybe where i've had not much to do because the first part of lockdown for me i had i had a job i was really busy um yeah, I had a lot of stuff going on in my life, uh, wasn't very happy um, and then kind of come through into the second half of the year and then things changed a lot for me and um, things going really well and then I lost my job. I was in a really good place so it didn't really phase me too much um, and I'm lucky I was because I've been okay ever since really. Um, yeah. But, uh, but okay. yeah, I'd say okay. so. So yeah, I was pretty content during the second yeah. half of the year having a job. Basically. Yeah, I was happy sure. just to carry on. But so, but I, I suppose it's, I mean, I think it's been a challenge for so many people, isn't it, to to actually rethink about what they've been doing this past year or yeah. what they haven't been able to do, whatever. But um, to actually sort of challenge them to think, am I, you know, fulfilled in what I'm doing? Yeah. And, um, or is it time to look for a new career? I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. 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 Hundred yeah, percent. I think where you're not. Where you're so, so chatting to you briefly before this, uh, just about where you're not actually in your office around your friends and in that environment, and you're just doing your job at home. Yeah. 
that's when it becomes real, that that's your job. Do you actually enjoy the nuts and bolts of your job or not? And uh, I was definitely kind of <laughs> sitting there thinking, is, is that just a kind of an extrovert thing, do you think? Because I'm like that, you see, I, I have to be with people. Yeah. Uh, you know, I can't stand it, although a lot of my work, you know, my job is, is, is yeah. in my study, doing stuff on the computer. Yeah. But my greatest joy is getting out and... Yeah. Well, I mean, your job, the actual nuts and bolts of your job, or what you're doing to, to work, is only part of it, you know, yeah. the rest of the job, the rest of the kind of pies, all the stuff that comes with it, like the socialising, the talking, the, the meeting people, the, just the stuff that humans like to do. And I think that's why people do certain jobs, because you get more of that, or some people might like to be in a basement doing their thing, that's just different, yeah, yeah. People are different aren't they? Sure, sure. But, um, yeah, I don't know, it's very different, I mean, where you're not up there, so it does give you a chance to kind of think about what you want to do and stuff, sure. but, but I guess your vision's quite cloudy because you're basing it on what you've been doing indoors, I don't know, yeah. but uh, yeah, it's definitely a good time to change, it's a risky time to change, I'd say, mm -hmm. because if you're looking to change jobs mm -hmm. entirely at the minute where there isn't many going and you don't know what no. industries and stuff are going to look mm -hmm. like next year, so it's a bit of a risk to make that move at the minute, mm -hmm. so I'm kind of not planning to make that, that yeah. change at the mm. minute just because I've just bought a new house and got bills to pay and things yeah. so it'd be so you need irresponsible to take a big yeah. plunge yeah. And, sure. and risk sure. that okay. um, but yeah definitely within the next few years if things don't get back to normal soon which would be nice yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah definitely so i tell you what, what I'd like to do I'd just like to just, just pray for you really while we've got this right chance right? I'm yeah. just going to just uh, uh, a simple prayer because I think for all of us, you know, we've all been, um, you know, had to rethink about what we're doing and, um, you know, um, and where uh, the next leg of the journey is going to go. So I just want to pray for you, Lord. Just thank you for Jack. Um, thank you, Lord, that you've um, you've been speaking to him about perhaps a change of career. Um, and uh, Lord, I just pray that you would just um, uh, just open up new opportunities and. Um, yeah, new doors for him to, to walk through uh, and that you'll just uh, give him just the right um, the right opportunity Lord for him to pursue a career Lord that is going to be fulfilling uh, for him so just bless him Lord I pray in Jesus name Amen. Okay. thanks Jay cheers thank you we're reading from Luke chapter 14 verse 25 as massive crowds followed Jesus he turned to them and said when you follow me as my disciple, you must put aside your father, your mother, your wife, your sisters, your brothers. It will even seem as though you hate your own life. This is the price you'll pay to be considered one of my followers. Anyone who comes to me must be willing to share my cross and experience it as their own, or they cannot be considered to be my disciple. So don't follow me without considering what it will cost you. You know the end of my life story, most probably. Would I ask your indulgence to hear uh, another part? My story up to midway through Jesus' ministry. At that point, I was still his friend. Judas is mostly known for one thing, betraying Jesus. But was Judas always an evil person? Jesus chose him to be a disciple and he followed Jesus faithfully for some time. Judas is not unlike many others through the ages who began as faithful followers. Mine was a common name during my lifetime. Think of two original 12 apostles, Jude Thomas or Jude Thaddeus or even Jude, the brother of Jesus. I was the outsider of the Twelve. From the beginning, I dressed differently, I spoke differently, and I thought differently. Although the Gospel writers don't talk of my interactions in the group, you can guess that I didn't have any close friends among the Apostles. And when I struggled, nobody to confine in. I was very skilled with money, and was chosen to be the treasurer of our group. Even though Matthew was known to be extremely talented in that area, 
The Bible doesn't say when, where, or how I became a disciple. You do know it was early into the ministry of Jesus. He believed I could be a fisher of men. I was as dedicated as any of the other apostles those first couple of years. I mean, I wasn't outspoken, but neither were the six other apostles that you know very little about. I was sent out as a pair with the other 12 and, and then as a pair with the 70. I saw Jesus do miracles and healings and heard all his teachings. I did miracles and healings. For the first couple of years, you wouldn't have been able to distinguish my ministry from the other 11. Jesus did not distinguish me from them either. He loved me as much as he loved them. I am Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Scholars of your day have concluded that my father's name meant we came from Kiriath, a town about 10 miles south of Hebron or 30 miles south of Jerusalem. Those scholars have concluded that I was probably the only one of the 12 apostles who was not from Galilee. One Sabbath, we apostles went with Jesus to eat at the home of a prominent Pharisee. We were relegated to the chief seats in the back of the room. Jesus was seated near the front. As often would happen, the Pharisees were trying to find a way to disparage him. A man who was an obvious plan came to stand before Jesus. He had some abnormal swelling and it was apparent to everyone in the room that he needed healing. Rather than being caught in a trap, Jesus set his own by asking, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? <sighs> hey, what a question. I mean, the Pharisees and experts of the law knew the spirit of the law encouraged such an action, but their man-made rules prohibited such a thing. They were caught in a trap of their own making and had no out. They could do nothing except remain silent, even after Jesus healed the man. Ah, the uncomfortable silence. Everyone hoped Jesus would change the subject until Jesus changed the subject. He looked around the room and, and made the observation that everyone had been scrambling to get seats of honor. Imagine the red faces because they had been doing just that. Jesus pointed out that it was smarter strategy to take a lower seat and then receive a special honor if the host moved you to the front, eliminating the risk of being embarrassed in case the host asked you to take a lower seat. I'm sure that was embarrassing to all the guests in the room, but it was more embarrassing when they later realized he wasn't talking about seating at a dinner, but being humble in a relationship to God. And Jesus then looked at the host and told him that he was not righteous when he invited friends and family to a dinner because they could just pay him back. But it was righteous to invite those who were not able to pay him back. It must have been a shock to the host and all the guests looking, looking around. I mean, the only poor people in the room were Jesus and us, his apostles. I doubt anybody in the room had ever purposely invited a poor person to a dinner, except for a few relatives. Maybe. It was in situations like those that I began to be uncomfortable. Jesus not only insulted his host twice, but also insulted all the guests in the room. I, I wanted respect from the religious leaders, always did. But I also always hoped for some financial support from them too. Jesus never seemed concerned about money. I mean, in retrospect, I guess if you already own the whole universe, there isn't much on earth that you need. I mean, consider that in your own life. If you are truly the sons and daughters of God, what is it on earth that you don't already own? Well, back to the dinner at the Pharisee's house. There I was in my cheap seat, squirming in embarrassment. When one of the people near Jesus tried to change the subject again, the man said, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. That comment probably doesn't mean much to you, but it did to us in the room. I mean, we were all Jews. We had all been brought up with the notion that only Jews would be saved when the Messiah came. I mean, we did not have a well-developed notion of what heaven was or how you got there, but we were all certain that the Jews had exclusive claim to the benefits that would occur when the Messiah came. We were all certain. That was true, I mean, especially the religious leaders of the Jews. We were all certain. 
except Jesus. Jesus wanted everyone to know that the kingdom wasn't coming on their terms, but on God's terms. And Jesus had been announcing those terms. Those who weren't willing to accept Jesus' terms were going to disinvite themselves from the feast, while those who were willing to accept the terms would enjoy it. The parable Jesus told clearly showed the religious leaders as disinviting themselves, while the obviously unclean people would get to enjoy the banquet. The man's comment had been right. The ones eating at the feast were blessed, but he misunderstood who those people would be. Needless to say, the banquet ended on a sour note, and we were not given any gifts or support. As treasurer, I was quite disappointed that Jesus not only didn't raise any money that night, but he had antagonized people that could have made our lives much better. I should have known it was just gonna get worse from there. Not long after that, large crowds were following us everywhere we went. It would have been a simple thing for the Lord to give a little uplifting message and then pass the hat for some contributions from the crowd. Instead of doing that, Jesus raised his voice and said quite the opposite. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister, and their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. I can assure you that that is not the kind of message that is encouraging for a treasurer hoping to get more money. Your modern day translators and preachers can waltz around all they want, but Jesus said hate, and that is exactly what he meant. He meant that you not only had to be willing to do without those people and things in your life, but that you counted them as your enemies. And furthermore, he, he wanted you to become willing to give up your life, literally, in order to become his disciple. You can be assured that many of the crowds left before he could tell the next parable. The parable Jesus told next is my favorite because of its simplicity and obviousness. As with many of his parables, Jesus had seen something we had all seen, but had understood its deeper meaning. We had all seen buildings which were abandoned before they were finished, but never thought anything about them. Jesus understood them in a, in a different way. He said, Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. He finished that sentence and looked around, nodding at a partial structure in the distance. Not many of us wanted to build a tower, but many of us wanted to build houses. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to finish? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish the building, everyone who sees it will laugh at you. They will say, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. From his past lessons, we apostles knew Jesus wasn't talking about buildings. I can't prove it, but when Jesus said that last sentence, I believed he looked right into my eyes or right into my soul. Maybe that was the first time I realized I was not willing to give up everything to be his disciple. And, and, and if I wasn't willing to give up everything, I probably wasn't willing to give up very much. He made me count the cost of being his disciple. And I decided that I wasn't willing to pay the price. Mm. That was the day my doubts began. I recall Jesus saying, whoever is not with me is against me. Now that I knew I was not wholeheartedly for him, I started finding little ways to be against him. At first, I just discounted some of the things he said. I quit praying as much, and then not at all. I quit listening with attention. I wanted to raise as much money as I could. So I could steal more. If he said I was his enemy, I would prove that I was. You want to be a friend of Jesus? Hmm? How much are you willing to give up? Or, or not willing as the case would be. You can't do that. You can't be unwilling to give it all up. Jesus said that. Maybe you should quit trying to do what Jesus says you cannot do. You are either his friend or his enemy. And from my own example, you don't want to become his enemy.
Yes, well, Judas, eh? Yes. I thought this was going to be a, a tricky one, really, because it, it's, it's so difficult, isn't it? Because, like, he starts off saying, you know where the story ends. And yet, he was one of the disciples. He was there with all the rest of them, part of those miracles. And, and you know, seeing Jesus doing these amazing things. And yet, you know how the story ends? So you sort of think, oh no, is this a terrible warning? You know, Take heed, lest you yes. fall, sort of thing. Mm. Sort of like, oh, if you think you're doing okay, just be careful. You might turn out to be Judas. Mm. Well, I think he got a bit distracted along the way, though, didn't he? Because more and more... He got a bit miffed about the fact that Jesus wasn't doing any fundraising, and so, yes. so he, uh, he wasn't getting enough money in, mm -hmm. and he was getting a bit um, worried about that. And I, and I was thinking a bit uh, about, um, how, you know, you could, it's very easy to get a hardened heart. I mean, I've been a Christian for 35 years, and uh, mm -hmm. and I can remember a time, you know, when I, a time when you know, Jesus was doing incredible things. We were seeing signs and wonders, and it was mm -hmm. really exciting. And um, but yet, yeah, then I got married, I had children, and I got distracted. And I can see when I look back mm. that I sort of came off, off track. And my mm. emphasis was not Jesus, it was well, bringing up children, actually, yeah, and everything sure. else. Mm. And I think you don't realize at the time, I think your heart, your heart just begins to harden and yeah. focus changes. Yes, yeah, and yes, the distraction thing, isn't it? And, and the the expectation, you know, if Jesus isn't quite doing what you thought he'd be doing, yeah. or, or maybe your life's not turning out quite exactly. the way you thought it yeah. was going to turn out, and all the mm. rest of it, mm. that you sort of just lose, lose that focus. Yeah. But I think I think it's sort of you can take it that scary way, can't mm. you? Oh no, because we all lose focus yeah. sometimes. But um, there's something about the intention of the heart that mm -hmm. God will bring you back. Yeah, definitely. Because I know um, that at some point in my past, I sort of said to God, yeah, whatever and wherever, mm. you know. And it wasn't some blinding flash of light. It's just that, that sort of steady commitment. I, you know, I mean it. And I assume Judas meant it at some yeah. point, you know, yeah, yes, definitely. whatever and where. And then it got eroded a mm. bit. Mm. But the fact that actually at one point in that in the, what Judas was saying, he started making active choices. Mm. There was the distraction. And then he started choosing to go against. And I think that's where we always have that choice to turn mm -hmm. back again. Definitely. Every and, time. and God always, you know, has hold of us with that intention that we started out with. Mm. Yes, because Jesus says, if you're not for me, then you're against me. Mm. And I think, uh, I think just recently I feel God's taken me a bit down that path. And, and I've been really, had a sort of an extra hunger to want to know more of Jesus. Mm. And I've really been praying about it and saying, Lord, whatever it takes, I want to get back to that place. Mm. And, uh, and well, yeah, I just feel like mm. just suddenly it's been a bit of a revelation. So I think if we're always pursuing Jesus, mm. We're on track. It's just about you know, just go always looking to him all the time. Yeah, recognizing that we do get distracted. Oh yeah, we come back again yeah. and again. And God is always definitely. ready to put us back on track. Yeah, definitely. So, oh, yeah, yeah. He always waits, well there, doesn't he? Yeah. Waits with open arms for us to come back to him. Yeah. And I think he loves nothing better than restoring us. Yes. Again and again, if need be. <laughs> Certainly. Oh, goodness, he's a lot more patient than us. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. yeah. yeah.
So as we draw to a close, let's uh, pray together. And let's, as we do so, let's focus on, um, you know, being the best disciple that we can be for Jesus. And uh, I remember that, um, you know, that line in the monologue where, where Judas says, I was not willing to give up and pay the price. But in order to follow Jesus, we have to pay that price, don't we? We have to follow him. We have to go his way as, as he journeys with us. So let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you've taught us today. Thank you, Lord, that you are teaching us, all that you're teaching us through this tough time. And Lord, I just pray that as we um, move further, as it were, out of the, <coughs> out of the storm, um, out of this difficult time, Lord, that you will um, show us what you want us to do and uh, help us to, uh, Lord, just support and encourage each other in doing whatever you want. In Jesus' name we pray. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each one of us this day and always.